as a theoretical matter, is less exclusionary towards particular persons and traditions. Right? Capitalist success is thought to rely not upon one's inherited position, but upon one, what one can actually contribute to and benefit from others. Right? It's a transactional approach or philosophy. So black conservatives generally agree that the most effective and lasting strategy for collective self-advancement is through the large-scale multiplication of individual capitalist success stories. So, given the healthy respect for Western culture and Western institutions, right, given this pragmatic optimism, this anti-utopian disposition, given this healthy respect for capitalism, it's not surprising that one additional touchstone of black conservatism and black conservative discourse has been sort of an African-American Protestant work ethic. Right? Think of it as a middle class morality. Right? The foundations of success under this particular view are respectability, proper deportment, and a serious commitment to a healthy and productive lifestyle. So, so what we're talking about here is a belief or conviction among black conservatives that, that blacks were morally and spiritually obliged to make good use of the privilege of freedom. Okay. Now, these conservative themes, these four themes that I've talked about, coalesce into what has become the dominant form of black conservative writing, what I call the African-American Jeremiad. Right? Although the Jeremiad is uh, it, it sort of, it's one of these vehicles or modes of discourse that acknowledges the pervasiveness of white racism, it's principally an exercise in self-critique. And that's what's important, right? Black conservative writing is principally an exercise in self-critique. Directed at blacks, the Jeremiah speaks to the failure of blacks to take full advantage of their opportunities, often blaming blacks for their laziness, their parochialism, and their fetish for panaceas. Now, some of that may sound familiar if you've been watching what Bill Cosby, Skip Gates, and a handful of others have been saying about the black community. They have been engaging in this African-American Jeremiah, but they're not the first to do it. In fact, the earliest example is perhaps David Walker's appeal, in which he recounts the various forms of white and black wretchedness. Works by John McWhorter, Thomas Sowell, comments from Bill Cosby, but also Chris Rock, and I'm going to come back to him a little bit later on, all sort of fall into this category of self-critique. What each of the exponents of this genre share is a two-fold two conviction, that black problems can be best helped or hindered by blacks themselves, and that white racism is finally just an irritant that lacks the determinant power to define African Americans individually or collectively. Okay, so we know what black conservatism is now, right? We know it when we see it. We can smoke out black conservatism, right? But where did it come from? That's what I want to turn to next, right? Where do these themes and ideas come from? The story, I argue, begins with a guy by the name of Jupiter Hammond. And Jupiter Hammond was a Long Island slave and minister, born in 1711, a long time ago. Right? But Jupiter Hammond's ideas and thoughts provide a window into early black conservative thought. Hammond, of course, was a spiritual thinker, which means that his ideas on how blacks ought to live their lives were profoundly shaped by Christian evangelism. Hammond maintained, now he's a slave, mind you, right? Hammond maintained and often preached that blacks should eschew rebelliousness. They ought to reject the idea of being rebellious, that all blacks, including slaves, should instead focus on leading a proper life and seeking salvation from God. Why? According to Jupiter Hammond, rebelliousness carried with it the risk of sinful self-pride. Freedom, according to Hammond, was a privilege. And he urged free blacks to uphold moral standards and remain industrious in order to dispel prevailing notions about natural black inferiority and the concomitant inability to manage one's own personal affairs. Right? So in Hammond, we begin to see this program for black conservative empowerment beginning to emerge. It's a preference for slow, organic, 
a moralistic program of black improvement that's premised upon maybe cooperation instead of conflict with whites. Now, Hammond's conservatism didn't speak much to the material world beyond advancing a sort of strong work ethic, right? But others struck the balance more differently. There's another guy. His name is James Fortin. And he was born in 1766 in Philadelphia. And he's one of, the, one of these early classic examples of black conservative success. You want to think of a modern example. Uh, if you don't like history, think of a Colin Powell. Right? But a Colin Powell born in 1766, you know, sort of rags to riches, born in poverty, moves to the heights of, of government and public office. And at that time, civic leadership in Philadelphia was pretty darn good. Right? With minimal formal education, James Fortin begins working as a teenager, as an apprentice to a sailmaker in Philadelphia. He eventually earns the status of Philadelphia's preeminent sailmaker makes a lot of money and back then if you made a lot of money you went into politics and that's what he did but he was sort of a community organizer he sort of managed the black population in in philadelphia and you know fortin was deeply patriotic he was industrious he was respectful of formal education he became the leading uh, voice on black conservatism in the North. And he promoted his ideas at every opportunity, and I mean every opportunity, whether it was uh, you know, talking to the Augustine Society, meeting with the mayor of Philadelphia to criticize the scourge of black criminality. All right, sound familiar? Criticizing cultural practices of urban blacks as destructive of the black community. James Fortin was doing that way back in the day, right? In addition, though, and this was a pretty, pretty radical proposition, James Fortin petitioned the Philadelphia legislature to modify its formal education curriculum to include the instruction or teaching of whites about black culture, and importantly, black civility and black economic success. Right? So Hammond and Fortin, I think, provide a window into early development of black conservative thought in American race relations. I mean, what do we get from these two guys? Um, from the outset, we can see that black conservatism is going to be steeped in moral discourse. Right? For, 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 for Hammond, the guiding moral force of black conservatism was Christian evangelism. For Fortin, the touchstone of black conservatism was strict adherence to an ethical and temperate lifestyle. Right? This deep moralism within black conservative thought from the outset also reveals another feature that would be associated with black conservative thought for centuries, and that is a profound deference to authority, whether white or black. Respectability and proper deportment for early black conservatives yielded a profound acceptance of, of current racial conditions. And so when we look at Hammond and Fortin, we see the roots of the accommodationism of Booker T. Washington that would follow in the years uh, after they've died. Uh, now, one other thing that's worth emphasizing here is that Fortin, he had this strong desire for greater inclusion in American society. And so he began to really preach this notion that, that deep respect for Western institutions meant that he had to tell blacks that all they had to do was avail themselves of what America already had to offer in order to succeed. The tools were there. And that blacks simply had to lead, learn to lead productive and self-directed lives simply by embracing the best of what American society had to offer. That was it. And so we see the beginning of the sort of modern black conservative credo of self-reliance and self-determination happening back in uh, the, the 18th century. Now, the Civil War comes along. And the Civil War changes a lot of things. Uh, but it also changes the trajectory of black conservatism. Okay. Prior to the Civil War, black conservative thought is mainly a northern phenomenon, focused mostly on obtaining full participation of blacks in the emerging industrious, industrial capitalist society of the north. But following the Civil War, the nation's attention shifts to the south and distinctly southern concerns, like the agricultural basis of the southern economy, like poverty, like the lack of social, political, and economic advancement among the masses of black southerners 
Southern blacks began to focus on these issues.